mom's voice, my the, the speaker's voice, depending on the read. You know, if I'm reading a book, and I suppose when I think about the author, memories then count, or think about things that people have said, maybe not necessarily the memories, but like quotes or something. So if I saw my mom's face, that when. Dumbledore says to Harry that words are our greatest source of magic. I can hear that in Ian McKellen, Helen's voice, the guy that played the role in that movie. Right? I hear that. When I hear uh, the one that was played uh, by the one who died after movie two, I hear his voice. So, so, so I hear I hear voices, but Moses talking to a bush heard a voice coming from the bush, and there are lots of other individuals that had God speaking to them. The Greeks had God speaking to them. I mean, when you're reading the Iliad and the Odyssey, what you get is that the gods are actively involved and the individuals are thinking that these gods are talking to them. Socrates blames voices for some of his behaviors. Whose voice does he blame? He says so in the text. Yeah? Did you catch it? The inner oracle. The inner oracle. And he blames it specifically on Apollo. Hence, the dialogue's name is the Apology. Where did that come? Have you ever apologized to anyone? Well, I think by, by this age we all have, even if we're just joking, right? <laughs> but if you think of it, Apollo G is I'm giving the explanation for why I did such a dumb thing, or, or whatever, right? Uh, and, and if you think of it, Apollo is uh, officially the god of reason, um, among other things. The gods often had multiple options of what they, they were doing and so on. Uh, but um, as, as Socrates explains, his friend, uh, Chirophon, he's the one who heard the news, right? Uh, he's the one that goes to the temple. Uh, which you can still visit. It's another tourist site, by the way. Um, Mount, oops, Mount Parnassus. Sis, yes. It's another, uh, you could go and visit, uh, it's every day there's this crowded tourist place, lots of buses, all these people coming and walking around, but at this particular site uh, there was a crack in the ground and the temple was built right over it and the volcanic exhaust is coming out of this crack and they built the temple right over the crack and placed a tripod, a tripoded seat right over the crack, uh, and the priestesses would have to s take turns sitting on this uh, crack, uh, you know, the seat over the crack, inhaling the fumes, which asphyxiate you, by the way, and a line of questioners would pay the priest and go and get to ask the priestess their question. And the priestess would answer their question, and then they'd go away trying to figure out what the heck was that all about, right? Uh, but Chirophon asks the question, is anyone wiser than Socrates? And the priestess sitting on the stool says, no, basically, right? And wow, what does that mean? And of course, Chirophon comes back, tells Socrates, the god, Apollo, this is the voice of Apollo, uh, says that no one is wiser than you. And Socrates thought, that's ridiculous. Because he's famous for saying he doesn't know anything, <coughs> except that he knows he doesn't know anything. And that, he thinks, makes him better off than all the fools that he keeps talking to who thinks they know, who think they know stuff, 
And in the Elenike, the, the dialogue that he gives them, they end up not knowing and coming to realize that they don't know and getting pissed off at him for pointing it out. Hence, he's an asshole to all these people who are pretty famous in the town, etc. If you, if you watch um, Bettany Hughes' explanation of this, she gives you the, the whole history of it, uh, the Spartan uh, Athenian War, the idea of Pericles to have everybody just stay inside the town where the plague broke out and killed at least a third of all the people. And, and that kind of deteriorated the mood. One third of all the people dying of, of an illness that was pretty horrible. Even Pericles himself dies from this plague. Uh, and as a result, Sparta wins. And they kick out the democracy, replace it with 30 tyrants, uh, and her, their main job was to weed out democracy so that it never arises again. Um, let's not talk about contemporary uh, relevance there, uh, but in any case, the uh, um, interesting problem for a lot of people was that Socrates was told by the 30 tyrants to go and bring back certain individuals that had fled that were Democrats so that they could be put on trial and killed, and Socrates refused to go. But the tyrants didn't kill Socrates for refusing. That seemed to make him guilty. And by the way, so there are some people that argue it's not just the, the tri at the trial, it's not just that he's considered to be what? Not pious? Yeah. Because he's disrespecting the gods. Well, it's pretty clear that he does respect the gods. It's just that the way he respects them is a little bit different. And is he corrupting the children? Clearly. He's clearly corrupting these children. They go to these sophists to learn how to speak clearly. They're attracted to this guy who teaches them to make fun of the teachers and their elders. And that any adult who has a child that does that is pissed off at whoever taught them to do it. You know, that's just natural, right? Remember, there's Aristophanes' The Clouds, which is online. You could read it. And Socrates is a character in this play where he's being carried away from his school on a stretcher, and he's clearly drunk on something, and he's saying, I'm flying being really foolish. There's a real clown in, in the clouds. But, and so when Socrates is trying to defend himself, he says, the first group of people that I have to defend myself against are the, the ones who have been making fun of me for the longest. You know, they're, you know, everybody's thinking that I'm that way, uh, but that's totally wrong. Ask Plato, who's sitting in the crowd, as one of the jurors, really, you know, if I'm anything like that. Well, you can still go here. And uh, the priestess is no longer work uh, sitting on the stool, though, as far as I know. Maybe they have specials at night. I don't know. It'd be interesting. They have a light show, at least. Um, and it is walking distance. But Julian James argues that this business of voices in our head is a period where our bicameral like, mind is breaking down and we are now aware of the voices in our head. I'm not sure if the other great apes had this issue or if dolphins and whales had this issue with elephants. I don't know. Probably, though. But in any case, the thesis is that at least for some individuals, when they heard their, their thoughts, they were convinced that they were hearing the voice of someone outside of them that was telling them what to do or what to think. It's just a thesis. I have no, no real clue uh, if that's the case, if that was a period of time where men were going through that experience. But it was a very exciting book for a lot of people. And notice we do have individuals that we see talking 
on the street. I, I was at Cars the other night. I was standing, my daughter's doing all the work. I'm, I'm just there for the exercise and bothering people. And this woman walking with a cart heads right at me and says, I love you, honey bun. And I was, whoa, I don't know this person at all. That's kind of, you know, off the wall. Uh, and then I realized she wasn't talking to me, even though it looked like she was initially. She was on the phone talking to somebody else. I guess you're all used to that right now. For someone that grew up before there were phones, I mean, that you could walk around with. That's really still unusual for me. You know, I see someone walking by, I say hello to them, and they look at me, they don't even hear me. Why? Well, then I notice they've got earbuds, and they're listening to an audio book or something for homework. I don't know, but they don't hear you when you're this close. She was on the phone. She didn't realize, of course, that we were all able to hear her, or she didn't care either way. But it used to be that when you heard somebody talking like that and no one was around them, they needed help. Our current view is that when somebody's listening to voices and talking back to them and believe that they're there, they need to be medicated. Can you imagine what that would have done to Moses? And others, I mean, think of all the others, how much scripture would not have been written had that been the current mindset with regard to people that, you know, I, I heard a voice in the whirlwind. Okay, dear, have a seat. Did somebody get him a hypothora? I don't know. What do you give people? What do you usually give people that are hearing voices? Anything special? Or do you just wait for the LSD to wear off? I could be. I don't know. Um, but if you think, wow, this is the psychological view of what's going on here. But... Oh, here's our standard uh, model right now. Uh, just basically, it's, I, I'm sure it's changed quite a lot, but if, if you're curious, I just threw all those in there, spin one and, and so on and so forth. Um, we do know that the Greeks, of course, were religious. And at least 2,000 gods, says Bethany Hughes. Uh, I know the Hindu pantheon, if you call it that, is pan. Theon is Greek, or Pan is all, Theon is the God, right? So it's Pan, Theon, all the gods. Um, we're primarily aimed at successful accomplishment of some particular goal. So the God of the harvest, the God of feeding your cow, the God, the God of keeping your wife horny, I suppose. You know, all those kinds of gods, right? You know, special things you could do, special altars you could go to, all that sort of thing. Um, no wonder Buddha rebelled against it and said none of them are worthwhile. Um, Socrates didn't really rebel against it. Notice he defended himself. In fact, it seems like the, the people who are questioning him are just really being dumb. You know, Socrates, you're the one that's corrupting our youth. Am I the only one that's corrupting our youth? Yes. Well, they're stuck. That's a really good question, right? Because practically everyone else is sitting there. So if they turn around and we're, we're trying you for corrupting the youth, am I the only one? No. He's corrupting, and he, yeah, you know, that would cause hysteria. Uh, actually, it wouldn't cause hysteria because they were all men. Sorry, you know. 
where the word comes from. Right? Uh, but in any case, uh, uh, they just got them trapped with that question. Uh, and it seems pretty ridiculous to think that Socrates is the only one that's corrupting the youth. Uh, if you were training your horse, would you take it to just Joe Snuffy, or would you take it to the person who's known for being great at training horses? So there's a lot of practical arguments that he gives you. But the problem is that we know he was talking to people a lot, had been for his whole philosophical